From Shroud University, this is Russ Brial bringing you another discussion on the Shroud of Turin, the greatest mystery in the known world. Hi, this is Russ Brial with Shroud University bringing you another video blog. And today I have a special guest with us, uh, Isabel Pixek who is a world-renowned artist. In fact, I'm at her studio here in Los Angeles. And, and uh, I, I wish I could take the camera and bring you all around of the stuff that's, that's in this studio. But, but um, I gotta tell you a little bit about Isabel. I know she's gonna chime in here in just a second, but uh, uh, Isabel's story is fabulous. And you and your sister, Edith, escaped from Hungary? Yes. Communist Hungary. Um, you know, back, be, um, back in, uh, back then, and it'd be, <laughs> when, it, when it was still communist, and um, and at the age of, you were fourteen, your sister was sixteen, yes. eighteen, and eighteen, eighteen, 18. Yes. and uh, you submitted a proposal for a mural in the Vatican Library, and what yes, happened? Yes, the Pontifical Biblical Institute, and. Uh, there was a contest going on to paint a 400 square feet true fresco mural at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. 400 square foot mural. Yes, and uh, I made a sketch and everybody made, made sketches and they only num numbered them. No name was introduced and it was in an envelope and uh, I have won the contest. That's so. astonishing. And you were up against over 30 other just world-renowned artists. No, there were fewer, about six, six, seven. About six, seven. And, uh, the, but uh, good artists. And uh, among the judges was Father Engelbert Kirschbaum, who was the Pope's uh, art historian and uh, a very big shot at the Vatican Museums. And he was one of our biggest patrons. He loved that composition. But uh, they were very tense that I was just a kid. Fourteen. And, uh, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, so, so they didn't know who had done it. They didn't know if it was a man or a woman. Or they yes. certainly weren't, weren't yeah. expecting a 14-year-old no. to have been the person who submitted the winning proposal. And then you went on, and it took you how, how long did it take? You to, to do First, we, they required that I would work out a third of the so-called cartoon, the original size drawing for the mural, to see if I really am capable to do that. And so we, we did, my sister uh, had me, and I did it. And then Kirschbaum and all the judges came back, and they liked it very much. So. It was a go. So it was a, and, uh, it was a go. So yes, and it, it took almost a year. Almost a year. Almost a year because we had to do this huge cartoon. Then the biggest problem was to find a qualified craftsman to finish the wall. And when you say cartoon, this is just kind of the overall sketch of what of It's what a very do. precise copy in black and white what the mural will be. Mm -hmm. That's what professionally is called a now, mural. You, now, in, in, in your bio, you are called a monumental artist, meaning that you paint these massive murals that go yes, 30, 50 yes. feet high and the walls of cathedrals all around the world. 70. 70 feet high? Oh, my gosh. So, uh, so you better not have a fear of ladders if you're going to do your kind of work, right? No, no. I love to be on scaffolds. The scaffold. That's the environment which I really and what, love. What, and what you don't see right now, and maybe mm -hmm. we'll get some footage of it, is you've got these huge step ladders all in here and, sca and p pieces of scaffold. And it's um, and I and back and back here in the back room, you're working on some kind of stained glass. Yes, for, um, that's right. Yes, yes. And it's, yes. Um, so, but but you know the in. The reason that, that Isabel is so important to the discussion of the Shroud is that, again, we come back to the debate. And that is, if the, is the Shroud authentic, number one? And if it's not, then what is it? Well, if it's not authentic, then it must be the work of an artist. And so if we were in a court of law, if, we, if, if the Shroud was on trial right now, we would be bringing in Isabel as an expert witness to discuss whether or not 
from the standpoint of a professional artist, someone who is knowledgeable in all kinds of art, and even, and most especially, medieval art. Mm -hmm. And we would, be, we would be calling Isabel to testify and, and as, a, as, a, as an expert witness. And this is why uh, it's so important of what, of what Isabel is going to share with us uh, today, um, because uh, if it's an artwork, then it stands to reason that we should call upon the professional artists to weigh in on this. And so the, uh, in, in the, uh, something else which we don't even have time to go into, which you've written some stuff on too, is that not only is she an artist, but she's a physicist. And so, so which, is, which is really important because you approach art from, the, from a kind of a scientific standpoint. Yes. And, and really art, when you get down into the fine elements of it, really is a science where you're mixing chemistry and art and chemicals and, 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 and it really, you know, so in, in we've had conversations in the past in, in, in America, you know, we're kind of, you know, in our TV movie theater age, we're really disconnected from the world of art. And, and, it, and, it, and, and you know, so, so this, what I'm going to do t today, at least for right now, is um, we have this, she has published uh, several articles which you can download off of Shaw University. Uh, just go to the School of Art and you can see these articles here. You can print them off yourself. And she wrote an article uh, a few years back called, Is the Shroud of Turin a Painting? So I was just going to go through this article and just kind of uh, just kind of high points and let you chime in on these on these aspects of the of the article. So, um, you know, in point number one, we get right to the first page. The shroud is raw, unprepared linen, and it That's repels right. water. So, from the standpoint of an, of, of an artist, wood is 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 flax an easy thing to work with or is it hard to work with? No, not an unprepared flax is the hardest material to work on. That's why the medieval artists, for instance, were the greatest in preparing uh, linen and uh, it, it has to receive a gesso coat. So meticulously mean, prepared in many, many coats and okay. you, you have to send it in between and then again and again. It, it's a very tedious work, which makes the flex, the canvas, very um, non-flexible and you cannot roll it anymore. Okay. And so that already is a point that how could you roll back and forth the shroud if it would be a prepared canvas. It was a totally unprepared canvas which does not take water. It does not take the mediums. So how do you paint on it? So I'm going to bring, you know, yeah, that, I think that's a, that's a, that's a real uh, you know, interesting point that you yes, bring out later in this even, article. Even if you succeed to paint something on it, what can you paint on it? Certainly not a portrait like, like absolutely an anatomically perfect body. There is no way in the world you can achieve that on an unprepared canvas. And then when you go on here and you, and you, you talk about that, that further because when you talk about the fact that, that you know, the, uh, the paint has to be suspended in a medium. That's it. And, and, and you've the, talked about yes, this before yes, to me, is, yes, is, is, yes. That you, is, that, is that once the medium no longer adheres to the surface, the, um, the, the image is going to disappear. Yes. Actually, this point, which everybody misses, certainly Macron missed it, that's the most important argument at all. Because the layman always thinks that it's the paint particle which makes the painting, just because it has color. Yes, the color of the paint particle is very important, but it, it, it's a dusty material, it falls off, it does not make a painting. The painting depends on the mediums, and the mediums will tell you what century a painting, for instance, was, was painted in, because certain uh, materials like linseed oil was not found in the Middle Ages. They do, did not use it at all. But the colloidal mediums, mediums which are water soluble, 
very much the egg tempera, uh, glue gum, etc. These were the techniques which were used. And, and so a, a painting thoroughly depends on the medium, not the paint. Right, right. so the medium that is used is really everything. Beca yes. and, and you've explained to me b before, when you look in, 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 in art books and, and you see pictures of medieval murals and you see half of the painting is gone, mm -hmm. it's because the medium has disintegrated and, and, has, and has fallen away from, from whatever the surface is, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, you know, st you know uh, uh, wood or canvas, canvas. Or, or, yes. even, or even stone. It's fallen yes. away. From, and so therefore, when the medium falls away, so does the pigment, whatever the pigment is. And so, which is really interesting, because when you look at the shroud, this is a cloth that has been handled hundreds of times, folded, rolled, wrapped. And, I mean, if there was any kind of medium on the shroud to what was used, as in, in our, the chemist Walter McCrone says that there was some kind of a thin binding solution mm -hmm. medium. So this is this is not an inane discussion here. I mean, there are there's a chemist out there that says there's a that there's a medium on it, but but if there was a medium that was used to adhere pigment to it, there would be areas on the image where that medium has fallen away. That's from the right. from the cloth, as as we see in almost every medieval artwork, there are areas when you get you know several hundred years old, there are just simply going to be parts of that painting that are disintegrating. Yes, and and we don't see any evidence of that on the shroud. Yes, so when when we see the shroud, and we determine even a layman can determine that it's an absolutely continuous image, it means that there should have been an intact medium film. And, and uh, we don't see a medium film, so this is an impossibility. And what you've said in, in, your, in your paper here also yeah. is, that, is that when you get down to using a magnifying glass, or certainly what we've done with shroud research, even getting down to using a microscope, you know, you can see the medium. The medium is something that is very visible, yeah, very visible. in all forms yes. of art. Yes. And, yet, and, and yet, you know, here you, you get down into the microscopic even on the shroud and all we're seeing is kind of dehydrated cellulose. We're not seeing any kind of, any kind of paint medium. No, and, no um, absolutely and, and, not. Uh, so which is, you know, which is, you know, you know, key point if you're going to allege that it's a painting, um, then you would have to assume that it was created using, you know, typical or, or known artistic practices. Yes, and also any practicing artist knows that the medium would determine how a painting looks. For instance, with, with sheer egg tempera, you cannot paint a very naturalistic portrait like something. It will always show a certain decorative beauty. And uh, th this would have to be an absolute oil painting with very shiny oil mm -hmm, medium mm -hmm. on it to achieve such a naturalism. But then you ru run into another very big problem, and that is that every painting has to have an outline. Every painting right. has and, to have and an outline. Right, and everything starts yes. with an outline, and yes. then you kind yes. of move in from the outline. Yes, that's right, and even the natural edge of the, of the medium creates an outline. When you don't see an outline and you don't see medium, how could it be a painting? And so we have an image here with the shroud that has no apparent outline. The edges just kind of fade off and yes. just, just kind of just kind of disappear. And then, and then the other aspect that you've mentioned is is the issue of light focus. And That's very important. Now, yes. can kind of explain uh, what what you mean by light focus? It's simply. You, the viewer sees what, what, where the light is coming from. And also the lines, every line on that painting would run toward that light focus. So it, it creates a, a geometrical network, so to speak. Now, the, the shroud has absolutely no light focus. There is no such thing that I would say that, boy, that's where the light was coming from. and. The strangest thing happens that it still has a natural perspective. How? 
the greatest contradiction one can ever mention. And not only that, but that presents what, what the artist calls foreshortening. So that going, the lines going toward that light focus shorten, 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 and shorten. And, and this happens with the Christ figure too, that the knees are apparently very much pulled up, mm -hmm. and the figure leans quite a bit forward. And so th that's how even medical men lose about two and a half inches in the length of the body because they don't count on the knees which were pulled up. You cannot put a measuring tape to the top of the head and pull it up to right. the toe, and that's how Christ was tall. You have to follow these undulating lines. And so he was taller. He was about six, I would say about six feet one to two. Six feet maybe, okay, wow, okay. So now what's interesting is this, this concept of foreshortening is, um, is as an art technique was not practiced until the Renaissance? Exactly, it was not even known absolutely not known. The anatomical foreshortening came in with, with Piero della Francesco. He was, he was a mathematician, by the way, okay. a scientist artist. And he introduced the, the idea at all that lines foreshorten, that is a geometrical foreshortening. And then Uccello also started to do that. Then the Renaissance masters, of course, they already know. And what, uh, what, what foreshortening would be it, typically in an artwork is, is, you know, art in a sense is creating an illusion, if, if you will, right? Yes, and, and, exactly. And, and, so, and so foreshortening would, would be, um, in, in the case of, let's say, a landscape. Um, would, would be you would have uh, to create the, the, the idea of distance. That, exactly. that, so yes. you know, something yes. off in the distance would be painted smaller, but something, yes. but, but something that is given the perception of being up close would be painted larger. Yes. And so you're creating the, you're, so, in a, and so even though you have a two-dimensional canvas, you're creating the, you're creating the illusion of distance. Yes. Okay. Yes, and that's what, and that's how foreshortening is 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 achieved. And so yes. what, and I believe what you're saying is that is that we have evidence of foreshortening on the on the shroud, but it's but it's natural foreshortening in the fact that 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 the arms appear to be their original length because you have the cloth draped over the arms. Yes. But you have the shoulder pulled forward and you have the legs pulled up. Therefore, yes. therefore, you you give the appearance of the front of the frontal image appears shorter than yes. the than yes. the than the than the dorsal image yes. uh, or, the, or the back image because of this of this natural foreshortening, not 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 as an artistic illusion, but that the body was in fact drawn up, and that and that whatever caused the image on the shroud. You know, created this natural foreshortening. Yes. But the yes. but the but the significance of it is, is that I mean we have a documented history in Western Europe of the shroud beginning in 1356, and you're saying that foreshortening as an art technique wasn't even understood or practiced until no. the 1500s or 1600s. No, earlier, but about a hundred, a little over a hundred years after okay, the first years later. Okay. exhibition okay. of the shroud. Okay. So, yes. the, yes, um, and. Uh, it, 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 this is a very important thing. People don't realize how important. The other day, I suddenly even realized a very strange thing that no, no one realizes that, that you never, ever actually touch a painting. You touch the wall. You touch the canvas. You touch the, the stone, but not the painting. It remains a an illusion which hovers beyond all ah, these things. Yes, beyond, I see what you're you saying. never can can even the artist cannot touch you it. You can't touch the painting. I mean all yes, you're do all you're yes. doing is touching paint yes, that's, that's right. applied to the wall. Yes. Because yes, really the overall yes. painted work is an illusion. Yes. In in other words, if you go to a museum and you stand in front of a big painting, 
you never can enter into it. Right. You always remain the outsider. The shroud is one piece where whoever stood in front of the canvas entered into it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that, that's another. Oh, I like that now. <laughs> that, impossible. That, that's very yeah, intriguing. Yes. 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 So, uh, so all, all the way. Then another very, very important thing, very important, which again people don't realize, that an artist paints a very detailed, even a detailed painting like, like the Renaissance masters, painted little flowers and plants and everything in the foreground. You can even tell what kind of a plant it is and things like that. But no, no one can come a hundred years later and say that, oh, I discovered that there is this and that and that more on that painting than what anybody has noticed. No one can say that because a painting will always show as much as what the artist knew. Right. right. The shroud, every minute, comes up with something new, something more. Science knows more about this, more about that. We recognize, who oh, the shroud has that too. And, and even shows future things which we don't even understand. A painting has its limit, and the limit is the artist's own head. That's I think that's that's really important, and, and I don't know if it's in this paper or in another one. No, I don't but, think but, I wrote But, but you, you have discussed this thing called an event horizon, which using it in the context of how you use it in, in your paper is that is that we in the 21st century cannot project ourselves back into the 13th century or 14th century and just say, that, 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 that these materials were available, therefore some medieval artist could have produced a, 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 a photograph or, you know, the, the, yes. the, the whole camera obscura discussion. Or, you know, it's really a ludicrous argument because, I mean, you can see it in our own culture. I mean, just, just, just rewind ourselves only, only 20 years ago. You know, here we, here we are, 2008, let's go back to 1988. And who can imagine a world where there's MySpace and Facebook and YouTube and Google and Yahoo? I mean, you you can't you couldn't even comprehend it, and that's just 20 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, yes. so 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 how then can yeah. we inject 21st century thinking into the 13th century, and and meaning that that we are supposing those that want to suggest that the shroud is um is an art is, is an artwork. Um, uh, they have, um, you know, come up with all kinds of, of, you know, technologies that someone could have come up with to artificially create this image, but the, begs the question of why would they? And they, and they just flat out couldn't have because you're asking this artist to literally put their minds into a different century. Yes. And it, and it's and it's just not possible. Any any more than than you listening right now could can 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 project yourself and and, and think about what the twenty second century is going to be like. Yeah. You can't. You just can't do it. Yes. And it's yeah. um, and and so uh, you know so there's there's always the the uh, the uh, the cultural time barrier. That, oh, that, that's that you excellent, can't cross. Ross. Excellently said. Because one of the basic qualities of art is that it precisely and absolutely fits into its own age. No, nobody paints something completely out of his own age. And the and and the, the 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 striking thing about the shroud is that again, alleging that it's something crafted by the artist in the 1300s, would suggest then that well, we don't know. We haven't seen anything like it before or since. It just kind of drops in from outer space almost. Yes, and, and, yes. And, and so from that standpoint, it just does not in any way fit the artistic milieu of the yeah. 1300s or yeah. even if you, and I think that there's quite a bit of evidence now to show that it was in Constantinople. And so even from a Byzantine context, um, which even, uh, you know, Byzantine artwork had even less realism than, yes, than, say, than say Roman art did. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. so, so the, um, you know, so, and all of this discussion w related to this being medieval is, is again, 
those because we do have there is a kind of a there is a gap let's say in the history we it shows up we were fully documented historical trail from thirteen fifty six until now and then we have a documented trail of another cloth with with an image on it that it sounds sure sure sounds like the shroud that it has a history from sixth century to uh... to twelve oh four when it disappeared during the fourth crusade so the, the the discussion here is that okay well how can we prove that what disappeared in constantinople is the same cloth that appears in Luray, france in thirteen fifty six so we have this hundred fifty year gap where the history is not perfectly continuous and so there are those that would allege that the shroud is uh, that that whatever disappeared in Constantinople has got nothing to do with the shroud, and what reappear and what appeared in 1356 must be the work of some medieval artist. So that's just some background to this whole d um, discussion. It's um, okay. Now I want to talk to you about something else. Um, in the chemistry side, uh, our Walter McCrone has alleged uh, that the blood is uh, not blood. Uh, but is vermilion paint. Now, let me give it a let me give it a sidebar to this. On Shroud University, it's a podcast. You can listen to it. It's a debate between uh, Dr. Gil Lavoy and Walter McCrone, where they discuss this. And you have blood chemists Al Adler and, and John Heller who analyze the blood. They say it's blood. Now, these are blood chemists. That's what they do. They analyze blood. And now you have Walter McCrone who says, Oh no no no. No, it's not blood. It's vermilion. Now, if you dig down a little bit deeper than that, you'll know, you'll realize that the techniques of analyzing the particles was completely different. And that Macron left, they have these microscope slides of these, of these, they, of, of, they, 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 they took uh, sticky tape samples and pulled, you know, threads and fibers and, and debris up on this tape. And they applied these tape samples to microscope slides. Okay, and so Macron was given a, 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 some of these slides to look at, but and but he but he did not remove the particles from the acetate tape. He analyzed the particles through the tape, and when you're and when you're using a refraction microscope, however that thing works, um, and I'm I'm a generalist. I don't know all things about all this, but but all I all I know is that is that when you analyze the particles through the tape it gives you a completely different index of what's oh, what's yes. called a refraction index now what adler and heller did they removed the blood particles from the tape cleaned it with a solution to get off all of the glue from the tape and then did their analysis and so the and so the question is how could Macron come up with one idea that it's that that it's that it's paint, and Adler and Heller come up with a whole different determination that it's blood? Well, you have you know, obviously Heller and Adler did a much better job removing the particles from the from the slide to make to make sure that that's all they were looking at was just the particle yes. and not glue and not tape and not everything else. So Macron, uh, you may, some people may get upset about this, but in his laziness, he just left the particles on the, on the tape, Im immersed in the glue, and did his analysis that way, and, you know, and, and, it, and it came off with a completely different yeah. refraction index. Oh, so oh, this, is, this is important to know. Now, so now we have, now we have Macron saying it's vermilion. Now, as an artist, <laughs> tell me about vermilion. Vermilion. How can this man be a, a chemist? First and <laughs> above all, it takes a paint chemist who is vastly different than a regular chemist. He should have known that vermilion is one of the most dangerous paint materials known to art. And most artists are, it's, it's a brilliant, beautiful color, which, which is red, and yet some bluish tint comes through it. It's fabulous. But you use it, as I did on one of my prize-winning paintings. I was a very young artist, 12 years old. I won a first prize with the painting, took the painting home, looked at it the next day, and the face was black. The vermilion through 
totally unknown reasons. Nobody knows, even paint chemistry no, does not know why it turns suddenly black. And sometimes even by touching an other paint turns black. So it's very unstable then. Very, very unstable. It cannot be exposed to, to air, to sun, etc. So it can't be exposed to air or sun, and yet we know that the shroud has been publicly yes. ex exhibited hundreds yes. of times yes. ever since, at least in Western Europe, ever since 1413, it's been exhibited publicly with, you know, being held out to the open air into the sun. So if these alleged, if, if, if these paint stains, um, if, these, if these blood stains are, as Macron says, uh, vermilion paint, they would, be, they would be black as charcoal by now. Oh, it, it's nobody in his right mind uses vermilion for these reasons. No, no matter how beautiful it is, it's very beautiful, but very, very dangerous. Now, you did an experiment, um, in a, it's either in this paper or another one, where you actually had a piece of linen, uh, and you painted it with typical uh, medieval paints, including vermilion. And, and what was your experience? What happened to the vermilion when you painted it on the unprepared flax? Oh, it, it really doesn't even cover the canvas. No matter what you do, it just does not cover. And I didn't wait to see it until it turns black, but most probably it would have. And uh, so, to, to, and vermilion does not have the color of, of blood. It has a completely different color. So why would he, he say that the, the, the blood was painted with, with vermilion? These are insane arguments. I so know. basically what we have here is a situation where Walter Macron finds a particle of vermilion on one of these microscope slides and says, aha, the blood must be made out of vermilion. Yeah. The problem is what he didn't do or chose not to do is, is that he didn't look at the, at, the, at the historical background of the shroud where we know that the shroud has been literally touched by oh. we, we can document over 52 paintings That's that have been right. touched to the surface of the cloth and you did an experiment to yes. see whether those yes. particles would actually fall yes. off. Yes, I, I was wondering how we could prove that the, the few paint particles which you find on the shroud were passed on to it by the true copies. And so I, I went into partnership with Dr. Köhler who had a magnificent mic microscope with a camera on it, on top of it. And I painted little squares with all kinds of medieval materials, like uh, just uh, gl gum, uh, glue, just water, egg tempera, egg oil tempera. These were the medieval techniques. And I painted some with oil. And uh, I also, left squares of the same linen untouched. They were pristine. And we passed the pristine canvas under the, under the microscope and put on top of it the painted canvas face down and slightly rubbed it, not much, just as much as you would when you want to authenticate a copy. I, I, we pulled the thing off the, the microscope, looked at it, it looked like this starry sky filled with paint particles. So, so it, it was all, proven so, so that, had, had yeah. In it, fact, it, rubbed off. Yeah, yeah, rubbed off completely. And it, not only mm -hmm. that, but we were even be, be able to say which technique passed the most particles on, on the shroud and they were the medieval techniques. The, so the medieval art techniques yes. had, had the most number of loose particles that would have yes. gotten onto the cloth. Yes, the, the later oil paints, the very early oil paint, which was mixed with egg tempera, they few they passed, but not too many. But the real hardcore oil paints, 
the, 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 so, so we, we cannot talk about the So that's, a, that's, a, that's a strong completely. validation, you yes. know, using a valid experimental method uh, yes. that, in fact, these yes. medieval paintings would have dislodged particulate matter onto the cloth, onto, yes. the, onto the shroud. Yes. So yes. we're going to take a, a, a quick break, and we'll be right back.